Apple II wire-by-wire -wire build. Clock and color burst. I'm Dr. Matt Regan. In the last couple of videos, we added a raster generator to our address bus and data bus. When clocks low, the raster generator has control of the address bus. The raster generator octal D-type flip-flops will output an address, and this is used to look up the static memory, where the image is stored. The output from the static RAM then goes along the data bus to the shift register, and this is where the individual pixels are shifted out. At the same time, the address feeds back into the raster generator EEPROM. This looks up the next screen space location, and on the rising edge of clock, this is latched into the address flip-flops. Now, when clock's high, the 6502 has control of the address bus, and it can either read from or write to the memory system. Clock goes low, and the cycle repeats. To understand how color works, let's look at the cathode ray tube again. In a color CRT, there are actually three electron guns, one for red, green, and blue. And then the front of the screen actually contains a mask with three different types of phosphor and they'll glow either red, green, or blue when hit by an electron. And using some magnets and some focus trickery, they arrange it so that the red electrons only have hit the red phosphor, the green electrons only have hit the green phosphor, and you guessed it, the blue electrons only have hit the blue phosphor. The NTSC standard came out in 1941, and they added colour in 1954. But they wanted the system to be backwards compatible, and to do this they added a colour carrier. This new signal is 3.579545 MHz, plus or minus 50 Hz. This frequency is so high, it can't normally be displayed on a black and white monitor or TV. Just as an aside, when I use the word TV, I'm referring to the signal that comes out of the RF demodulator, which is a composite NTSC signal. I'll use the terms TV and monitor interchangeably. I've tried to avoid too much analog electronics in this playlist. The Apple II is mainly a digital system. But I just need to introduce a little bit here to understand colour. The sinusoid is the backbone of analog electronics. The electricity that comes out of the wall socket is a sine wave, and when an inductor resonates with a capacitor, it produces a sine wave as well. There are four fundamental properties that define the sine wave. First is the time taken to complete one cycle. This is the period, and this is actually the same as digital electronics. The frequency is one over the period, and this is what happens when we double the period. The next property is the amplitude, and that's the difference between the sine wave's average voltage and its peak voltage. And it's pretty straightforward to see what happens when we double the amplitude. The next property is the DC offset, and this is the difference between zero volts and the sine wave's average voltage. And finally, we have phase, and we measure phase relative to some fixed point in time or relative to another sine wave. Here, both waves are in phase, which means the bottom trace has a zero degree phase shift. When we offset them by a quarter of a cycle, it's a 90 degree phase shift. Now the signals are completely inverse, this is a 180 degree phase shift. Three quarters of the way through the cycle, we're at 270 degrees. And if we keep going, the signals eventually line up again. This is 360 degrees which is also zero degrees. If you're not familiar with this, maybe replay this part of the video, or even write it down. Let's have a look at our standard video signal, but add this 3.579545 MHz signal on top of it. When we present this signal to a black and white TV, the electronics inside the TV flatten out this sine wave, and we only see the DC offset. As a result, it displays this sine wave as grey within the scan line. When we present the same signal to a colour TV though, it does see this 3.579545 MHz signal. And let's say in this case, it interprets it as red, and displays red in this region of the scan line. But how does the colour TV actually know which colour to display? And the answer is, the TV uses the phase, the amplitude, and the DC offset of the sine wave to figure out the colour. But remember I said that phase is relative to a starting point, or to another sine wave. So we need to compare the sine wave to a reference signal. And to do this, the Color TV or monitor maintains its own internal 3.579545 MHz signal. But how do we make sure that this internal clock has the same phase and amplitude as the clock used to generate the signal? 
If they're out of phase, the colours will all be wrong. The solution is the colour burst signal. If we have a look at our scan line again, the colour burst is this short signal in our horizontal back porch. So it occurs before we start to get any active video. Let's look at it in a bit more detail. We have our old friend, the H-Sync signal. Then shortly after that, we get nine cycles of this 3.579545 MHz signal. Then some clever electronics inside the television synchronizes the internal clock to the phase and the amplitude of the color burst. After color burst, we have this short period of a black signal. Then we step into our active window. In this case, we then display white, which is just a constant voltage without any 3.5 MHz signal. Then there's a color signal after that. The actual color displayed is determined by the phase and the amplitude relative to our internal clock, which has the same phase and amplitude as our burst signal. If it's in phase, we display this yellow color. A 90 degree phase results in this cyan green color. 180 degrees is blue. And 270 degrees is this red purple color. Let's look at it a bit faster. The Apple II only uses phase for color generation. Now imagine that the frame buffer contains an image with alternating white and black pixels. Because our dot clock is 7.159 MHz, this will come out as a square wave at 3.579545 MHz, and our color monitor will interpret this as yellow. If, on the other hand, the frame buffer contains black then white pixels, then the monitor will see the same 3.579545 MHz signal, but 180 degrees out of phase, and we know this will cause it to display blue. I'll go over this and how the Apple II generates the other two colors in a later video. This was just meant to be a sneak peek. In this case, the Apple II is the source of the color signal for the monitor, so it needs to generate the color burst signal. I'm going to put it in this region, just at the start of the back porch. We need nine cycles for the color burst, and each cycle is two dot clocks wide. It's high for one dot clock, and low for one dot clock. This means color burst is 18 pixels wide, so we're going to need three characters for this. We can derive our color burst reference signal by dividing our main 14 MHz clock by four. But we need a way of adding our color burst at precisely the right time, remembering that we only want it on for three characters. And I can program in a region very similar to HSync, except here it's only three characters wide, and we want to locate this bar in the 8000 address range. And note the color burst signal coming out of the 74HC138. Now, in retrospect, I probably should have called this color burst enable, but I can feed it with the 3.579 MHz reference signal into the original circuit that was used for the Apple II. This should insert the color burst into the NTSC signal. Now let's look at the clock circuit in detail. The Apple II uses a 14.318 MHz crystal. We can divide it by 2 to get our dot clock, and divide it by 4 to get our color burst reference signal. Finally, we divide it by 14 to get our character clock. These are cheap and commonly available crystals. Let's look at our scan line with the 14.318 MHz crystal. 65 times 7 times 2 is 910. And we need this factor of 2 because our dot clock is half the frequency of our 14.318 MHz clock. But our color burst is our 14 MHz signal divided by 4. So how many color burst cycles in a scan line? 910 divided by 4, which is 227.5. And this 0.5 is going to be a real pain in the neck. What it means is that our clock burst signal will be out of phase on alternate clock lines. Does this mean we'd get different colors on alternate scan lines? I believe this is what originally used to happen in the PAL system. But what would happen in NTSC? I suspected it'd just give up and display it as monochrome. So what did Steve Wozniak do to solve this problem? He made one character in the scan line eight pixels wide instead of seven. Now we have 65 times seven plus one pixels, times two gives us 912 clocks. So how many color burst cycles per scan line? 912 divided by four is 228. And because it's an integer, color burst will stay in phase between scan lines. In the breadboard build of the raster generator, I used the 74HC393, which is a dual 4 bit binary ripple counter. To generate the divide by 14, I ended together the three upper bits from a 4 bit output. 
and this signal was sent to the reset of the counter. So it counted from 0 to 14, and once it hit 14 it went back to 0, almost immediately. But I'm going to try a different approach in this video. Instead, I'm going to use a finite state automata. You'll remember that the raster generator itself was just a big finite state automata. But instead of a ROM, I'm going to use an adder this time. So here I have my octal D type flip flops, which I'm going to clock at 14 MHz. And now I have a 4 bit adder. I feed the output of the flip flops back into the adder in the B inputs. And I connect the output of the adder up to the input of the flip flops. For the other input to the adder, I'm going to set all the lines to zero except one. I'll connect up this other line in a moment. I'll make carry in high so it always counts up by at least one. And now I have these AND gates which detect 13. I'm going to send that into a flip flop and then feed the output back into the second bit of the A input of the adder. And from this, we can derive all the important clocks we need character clock, dot clock, and our color burst reference clock. Now look what happens as I clock the circuit. The signal goes through, and the output of the flip flops is essentially an up counter. This continues all the way up to 13. But once we get to 13, it rolls over to zero. Let's take a look at that last part of the count again. The flip flops hold 12. This feeds back to the adder. We add one because of carry in. And the adder outputs 13. The 13 is presented to the flip flops. But this time, all the inputs to the AND gates are high. This means our fifth input to the flip flops is also high. The corresponding output's high. And I've called this add two. And these all feed back to the adder. Now the adder will try and add 13, 2, and carry, which is 16, so it outputs 0. Carry out will be set, but we just ignore that. And we start the cycle again. Now if we go back to the circuit I used for the raster generator, one of the outputs of the 74HC138 is this wide character signal from 8000 to BFFF. What I want is for one single character to be 8 pixels wide. So I'm going to add in a one character wide signal into the scan line. And I'm going to put this in the front porch. Just as I've done with HSync and Color Burst, I need to program this into the raster generator EEPROM. But I'll save the actual code for the bring up video. Now let's have a look at the count when wide character is low. We count up as normal, but then when we get to 13, wide character will be low, which means that the add to signal will be low. So instead of adding 3, we add 1, and we count through 14 and 15. When wide character is low, we add 2 extra counts, which is what we need to keep the color burst in phase between scan lines. You've really got to give it to Woz for the elegance of this circuit. He was able to create color at almost no cost. And when you look at the other machines at the time, the Commodore PET and the TRS-80, I think it was this part of the circuit that gave two guys from a garage in Cupertino the edge over two large corporations. I think that's enough new information for one video. Anyway, next video, I'll start the build for the clock circuit. And don't forget, like, share, and subscribe.